This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. On August 8th, 2023, a devastating fire swept through the town of Lahaina on the Hawaiian island of Maui. It forced large-scale evacuations and destroyed much of the seaside town. Nearly a year later, we are joined by Andrea Kiloa, an assistant professor in the Department of Oceanography, and Sean Swift, a marine biology doctoral student from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, who have been working to understand the impacts of the wildfire to the coastal ecosystem. Thank you both for joining us today. I would like to start with a bit about the cultural relationship with the ocean in Hawaii. Professor Kiloa, can you tell me a bit about the importance of the ocean and coral to Hawaiian culture? Really, the the ocean is the foundation of our culture. You know, the ocean provides us with food. It's a place that we gather. It's a place that we practice our cultural activities. It's really important that we have a healthy coastal ecosystem, not just for the health of our community and their culture, but also for the perpetuation of our culture. In the Kumulipo, which is our creation chant, the koa, or the coral polyp, is the first organism to emerge from the ocean. And the human is actually, you know, the last thing to be created. So from early on, Hawaiians recognized how important corals were in basically the building block of the entire ecosystem. What do you know about how the wildfire started? Maui's been in a drought for some time, particularly Lahaina. The wildfires began on August 8th, and they went through the night and into the next day. We had really strong winds that day, known as the Kaua'ula winds, which have been documented in Hawaiian history to be powerful uh, hurricane force winds. And then our landscape has changed from native fire-resistant plants to non-native plants that essentially fuel fires. What are some of the impacts of a wildfire? I mean, what you think of first is maybe, you know, all the vegetation burning away, but also there, I think there's really important changes that happen to soil chemistry because as they, as they burn, they change the soil chemistry, it, it allows water to run off much more easily. So perhaps the biggest visual impact is you see more sediment in the ocean or maybe in streams. Um, and then there's also the invisible impact of, of waterborne chemicals, um, which could include harmful pollutants like metals or or harmful organic compounds? So far, we have measured high levels of copper and zinc for metals. um, And we're also seeing high concentrations of nutrients in coastal waters. We're not quite sure what the impacts of zinc is to coral reefs, but we have a lot of information about the impacts of copper and nutrients to coastal ecosystem health. What were some of the immediate concerns in the aftermath of the fire? It was basically a humanitarian crisis, right? So it was incredibly traumatic for us too. I mean, Andrea lived in an area that was threatened by the fire. um, And, you know, I had family friends on on Maui as well. So I think the first first off, it it was a human impact that we were worried about. But in the days following that, you start to feel like, how can I help? And what what can I do and contribute to this? And so as scientists and researchers that work in the ocean, we started quickly trying to build those bridges um, with people based on Maui and at the university who could who could do something to make sure that the fire wouldn't negatively impact the ocean, which is right next to that town. I mean, the island of Maui has world-renowned coral reefs, and, and the town of Lahaina is basically built around this natural barrier reef that provides a place for people to surf and go swim, and it draws in tourists and, um, you know, it feeds local communities. Uh, so that reef is is incredibly important to that town and that island. Over time, you know, we've heard a lot more concerns from community members who who use the coral reef as a place to fish. People are going out daily to these reefs to fish as their livelihood to support themselves to to eat this fish and to perpetuate their cultural practices. And so there's been a great deal of concern that pollutants from the town running off um, will get into this ecosystem. So one of the things that we're trying to do that is both of research interest and as a community concern is, is understand how pollutants might be moving through this ecosystem, particularly into fish that people are catching and eating. 
Our university, unfortunately, has a history of having to respond to disasters over water. And so there was kind of a framework already in place. We knew that we had to assemble a team with expertise in coastal water quality, coral reefs, metals, and contaminants, and a team that knew how to work in collaboration with our community. Um, Speaking of that community team, how quickly were you able to put together the team for this research project? It assembled pretty quickly, and I think naturally, based on people that had complementary skills. We were trying to cover all these different aspects of how a wildfire could impact the ocean. So that included contaminants such as metals or organic pollutants, um, things that could be associated with, you know, an entire town basically burning down and potentially running off into the ocean. And the team, I think, also was built of people who had different connections. So folks who are connected at the university level or or programmatic connections with the National Science Foundation, and then also folks who were connected to Maui. So Andrea, you know, lives on Maui and, and has connections to people there and, and the folks that work in that area. I know some of this work was funded under a rapid grant. How soon were you able to get out into the field and start investigating after the fire? I think we got out within a month of the fire happening. I don't think our research would have been possible without the funding we received from the National Science Foundation. And that was an incredibly quick process. So we reached out to a program coordinator. Um, there was there was a ve- very fast dialogue that occurred. And I think, you know, we're just one NSF rapid out of several that were awarded centered on this crisis. Interestingly, I guess, when we were there, it, it looks very pristine almost because um, as a result of the fire, there's there's been very little human activity. And so I think uh, as much as we expected to see strong impacts from the fire, you also have to think about the fact that this was a heavily trafficked area and that, you know, humans in our day-to-day interactions with these ecosystems also have impacts. I think another thing that's related to this is that the fires occurred in the dry season. And so we had several months before any rainfall happened that could push a lot of contaminants into this ecosystem. And so what we saw was a pretty strong divide, I think, between the terrestrial impacts, which were devastating, and impacts to the ocean, which didn't occur maybe until uh, much later. Conducting a rapid grant is very, you know, high pressure and stressful, but it's an important mechanism for being able to do timely and critical research and to collect perishable data. Now, Sean, I think this is more your department. What does the water sampling and testing process look like? And what kind of results are you finding so far? So the big question on everybody's mind is, is what has our testing revealed? And I think that's that can be hard to answer. We have some tests that are very quick and then some that take a long time and are, are very labor intensive. I think our media testing showed some spikes in, in contaminants that people were worried about. But overall, I think the news has been very good in that we haven't seen very obvious negative impacts in in the ecosystems that we're looking at, which is great. So our, I would say our testing is basically um, collecting water in a bottle, and we try to pull up as much chemical information out of that sample as we can. Um, so that includes looking at things like dissolved particulate metals and, and organic compounds, and these th- are things that could negatively impact humans or, or animal life or plants. And then we also look at primers that can tell us about how healthy the reef is, uh, such as dissolved carbon dioxide and oxygen um, that can tell us about how the reef is is maybe breathing or or growing or shrinking. I'm also curious about the automated sampling process the group is using. I know a certain amount of this happens at different times of day. For example, what kind of things can you only get at night? Yeah, so one of the tools that we use in this project is an auto sampler, um, which is a pretty simple concept. It's just a it's a computer that we put down um, at the bottom of the ocean, and it it can pump water into um, bags for us at different times. So this lets us capture how the chemistry on the reef is changing um, throughout the day and night cycle. And so if you spent any time around the ocean, you know that things change a lot from day to night in the ocean, and also as tides change. Um, It's important for us to be able to capture uh, information about the ocean over a period of time um, to understand what the whole is doing. Nighttime in the ocean is is a very interesting time from the perspective of corals. They're not getting sun anymore, and so they're they're mainly drawing down oxygen on the reef, um, and all sorts of different microbial activities are going on as well. 
And so it's important for us to be able to capture that information without having to go out physically into um, what can be a fairly hazardous environment. Have there been any challenges working with the community there? We've been very lucky in that it hasn't been very challenging for us, I think, because we we are trying to do something that that the community really backs. All the interactions we have with people when we're out doing our field work are generally positive. People people want to know more about um, what's impacting the ocean, and they they like to see that that people care and are trying to respond and, and help them out. Overall, it's been an incredibly positive experience. Everybody, I think, has shared goals and are, and are working really well together to make this this project a success. Um, so we've had a lot of support, and we're very grateful for that. I think we just have to be very sensitive and not put our science before people's immediate needs. I mean, people need housing, they need food. It's important not to not to distract uh, with our science that we're doing. So after the Lahaina wildfire, everybody was trying to find a way to give, giving time, giving, giving money and, and giving goods. And for me, I knew that I could give back to the community by focusing on ocean health. And so really, that's where I have been channeling all my energy for the past year. And um, it's also a healing process for me. This work that we're doing is part of a large collaborative effort of people that includes not just the University of Hawaii, but UH Maui College, federal agencies, local agencies, community organizations, individual community members. And so to be able to respond to an event of this magnitude really takes the collaboration of an entire community of people. I mean, we even have industry partners from across the world that are supporting us in this effort. So yeah, I just want to really highlight that we couldn't do this work without this very large effort of people that are all coming together for the benefit of a community. So we're nearly a year out from the fires now. What are some of the long-term impacts that you're seeing? One year out from when the fire occurred, I think it's still too early to know what the long-term impacts will be. Um, We think of a year as a long time, and I'm sure for you know people who've been displaced, it's it's an incredibly long time. But in terms of ecosystem impacts, um, for example, the taking up like the bioaccumulation of contaminants that could take much longer. So I think this is really going to be a much longer effort, and hopefully, will be tied into decisions that are made about how they're going to rebuild this town and and manage the resources in this area, perhaps differently, perhaps in a, in a way that will be beneficial. All right, last question here. What are the next steps for your work? We're starting to wind down on the sampling. We have a, a little bit more sampling this summer, but we really are turning our efforts to analyses, the laboratory analyses and the interpretation of the data. I guess if, if I had to add something, I would just say that and this is a project that's that's working on an ecosystem, but we're not viewing that ecosystem in isolation. Um, it's it's an ecosystem that that people interact with every day, and we're seeing that more and more as as people start to come back to uh, the town of Lahaina. So I think you know this project is a real opportunity to to kind of focus people and and get everyone together and, and thinking about how we can better protect these resources from things like wildfires, but also from all sorts of impacts and stressors that the ocean is facing right now. It is perhaps a hopeful thing for me to be working on this kind of forward-looking project. Special thanks to Andrea Kiloa and Sean Swift. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. You can watch video versions of these conversations on our YouTube channel by searching at NSF Science. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.